It's not lightly that the New York Times calls Andy Warhol the most important American artist of the second half of the 20th century. His influence has largely created our image-driven culture we find ourselves in today. I had come to know Warhol only through 32 Campbell's soup cans, never understanding the importance of a painting of a Coke bottle or a series of colorful Marilyn Monroe portraits. They sat in my textbooks under the header of pop art, as I dismissed Warhol as pressing copy and paste one too many times. However, at the Whitney Museum, experiencing his art firsthand, seeing his pieces in full scale and in relation to one another, I found an unexpected appreciation for Andy Warhol. Whether it was miseducation or lack of opportunity, I believed I would have continued to be disinterested in Warhol without this experience. It is the mass production, the large displays, and the cultural and social context that gives Andy Warhol's art fundamental meaning and value. From A to B and back again at the Whitney Museum of American Art does a fantastic job curating his work in these contexts, allowing the audience to reconsider or continue to consider what Andy Warhol was communicating with every piece. From A to B and back again showcases how purely American Warhol's work was, as it not only works to embrace the post-World War II consumer culture, but also question and fight with the countercultures that were rising from new generations. What's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same thing as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola and you know that the president drinks Coke. Liz Taylor drinks Coke. A Coke is a Coke and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. In putting together the exhibition, Donna DeSalvo reflects upon Warhol's own place in the American past, present, and future. She also aims to connect the art and artists to contemporary visual storytelling, branding, and the digital age of consumer technology and social media. Warhol really investigated the fundamental nature of what an image is how it lives in the culture, the mechanics through which the images that surround us come into being. Warhol's work breaks down how pop culture figures fit into society, reframing them in new perspectives or within a broader cultural understanding. Gold Marilyn Monroe frames the model like gold leaf works of Byzantine Christian icon paintings, telling us to adore the American celebrity as if a religious figure. Being the same year as her death, it may also comment to the veneration we have for the dead, especially towards famous people who pass away young. We see this reframing of popular images every day on the internet, with its expansive ability to allow the public access to information and the tools to create, alter, repurpose, and share this content. Oh god, I think the whole internet is Andy Warhol. A meme is really the flattening of an idea in an image. You take this original image and you dilute it so much that it changes, it travels different places, it is up for interpretation. In the same way memes create a visual communication language, Warhol's art democratizes images and art. The impact of visual language and the conversation on American culture and society run throughout from A to B and back again. As you move through the exhibition, entering rooms with varying themes, creating a narrative with Warhol's work. Starting with Campbell's soup can, the exhibition begins by grounding the audience in his world of commercial illustrations and the American capitalist culture. The piece that first caught my attention was Brillo boxes. Where we usually see products unpacked and neatly displayed in stores, Warhol exposes us to the industry that creates these products. The sculpture makes me think of the actual labor, the packing, transporting, and unloading that goes into our consumer culture. Andy Warhol grew an affinity for automation as a commercial illustrator surrounded by new print media technology. This first section showcases Andy's foundational work making prints for clients while pursuing a career in fine art. Playing between his public and private life, observing his identity as an openly gay man, his drawings of male nudes and portraits, sometimes even using gold leaf, are paired with his illustrations of designer shoes. Andy's work was so generous because it let us just appreciate everything around us as vital information. Warhol also let his physical self become part of his work. He continuously embraced new media and soon Warhol was never seen without his camera. We follow in his footsteps with the ability at our fingertips to create and share everyday life as artistic content. From there, Warhol built a brand around himself. 
Self-portraits reproduced his own image in the same way he did the rich and famous. Today, influencers can come from anywhere by how they present and brand themselves through image. Warhol would call this business art. Business art is the step that comes after art. It establishes that everything this artist has done or would do counted as components in one boundless work. Artists like Warhol have transcended beyond their work and become themselves brand names. The exhibition's narrative begins with Warhol exposing the everyday subliminal messaging and advertising of societal expectations. He blows up 1960s advertisements, full of control tactics and propaganda about patriotism and fake news, ideals of masculinity, and beauty standards. But who can uphold such standards? Warhol points to the cultural celebrity to manifest our ideals of beauty and success. These are the people we look up to, who are seen as perfect. Warhol had long-lasting fascinations with celebrities, often reflecting larger cultural obsession. For Warhol, the timing and selection of his subject was crucial. He created portraits of Elizabeth Taylor and Marilyn Monroe when their personal lives were made highly public. These subjects are not much different from today's cultural obsessions. By reproducing their images over and over, Warhol comments on the celebrity as a commodity. Here, he also questions if our obsession comes not from the significance or quality of things, but rather the mass abundance of things. These pieces work just as much to cement their subjects into the ideals of American beauty, success, and fame as they do to question the growing commercialization and uniformity of American life. Death and Disaster shows the consequences of impossible societal standards with images that contrast the glamour of Hollywood with the not-so-hidden reality of American life. It reminds us of the dangers of idolization, that these celebrities and public figures are just as human as us. These pieces leave us to question what is missing from the stories we see in a single picture. He pulls images from Life and Time magazines to note the spectacle of violence refracting from the lens of the media. There are themes of anonymity contrasting glamorized tragedy. Electric Chair spoke to me as a narrative of silence and passiveness to death in America, especially those who are anonymous, oppressed and marginalized, and in any way deemed unworthy of life. The contrast between the violent photo subject and bright feminine color makes a statement on how we culturally cover up and passively look over the negative and violent acts of everyday life. Anonymity is again seen in Ladies and Gentlemen. Unlike his other portraits, Warhol does not name these subjects. However, they were not truly unknown. Figures like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera were stars and activists in their own gay and trans communities. Amidst the AIDS crisis, continuous brutal policing, and political oppression, Warhol painted subculture trans rights activists in bright, beautiful, layered colors. Confronting one of the largest pieces of the exhibition, you become reminded of the overwhelming power images can have. By simply creating this piece, believed to be the most reproduced portrait at the time, Warhol was associated with and rejected as a communist. With these gigantic works, Warhol interrogates the power of an image to convey an idea or philosophy without even having to use words. Because images can carry such baggage, we must remain critically literate of what they represent and how they have come to have such meanings. Just as Warhol tells us to break down an image's meaning, images themselves break down as the exhibition and Warhol's narrative moves into more abstract ideas. While pieces like Mao ask what societal elements make up an image, Warhol's abstract work focuses on what physical elements create the image, in this case, urine and semen, sometimes his own and sometimes his guests. These pieces act as stark contrast to his hyper-mechanicalized prints, giving insight into Warhol's private life and identity. I think so many people forget that he was a human being. He had desire. He experienced intimacy and love. He actually brought so much of that personal narrative and personal life into the work. Camouflage Last Supper bookends the exhibition as it was one of Warhol's final and most personal paintings. The standard camouflage fabric pattern over Leonardo da Vinci's famous mural feeds into the dynamic tensions within religion, globalized society, America, families, and within oneself. 
While I could go on to flesh out the narratives this piece tells me, I will simply say that they all carry the same theme, a questioning of what lies behind what we present to the world. Warhol's continuous Byzantine Catholic practices were not fully revealed to the public until after his death in 1987. To the complexities of life and self-expression, Warhol states, nobody really looks at things, it's too hard. It is in this unique framing of everyday images that Warhol provokes conversation on culture, society, and identity. Walking through from A to B and back again, you come to learn Warhol's consistent and accessible visual language. By reproducing his image in the same context as Coke bottles and Elvis Presley, Warhol built a brand that not only defines American culture, but puts a mirror to it. Was Warhol political? I don't know. But I think his images speak to the inherent contradictions of the U.S. From A to B and back again allowed me to reconsider Andy Warhol by two reframing the contexts in which I originally came to know his work, understanding him in relation to the culture he existed within and helped to curate.